focus on getting some conversation going. So good morning, everybody. Again, welcome to the conversation. Um, we have been asked by the Indigenous Studies Department to uh, come together. My name is Marilyn Petra. I answer to Marilyn Poitras. Marilyn Petra, been accused of being a latte sip and half breed when I only say Poitras. And uh, my father and my grandfather have answered to all of the above. And so as long as you're being nice to me, I'll answer to, I'll answer to those names. Um, and I am, uh, I call myself a half-breed. I've always called myself a half-breed. I'm from the southern, southern eastern corner of Saskatchewan, the Capel Valley. My father is a road allowance half-breed from that area. And my, my grandmother's family are the Cardinals. And so um, Allison and Bobby have had some ideas about putting this panel together. And I just want to let you know who we've got in the room and we're really hoping that Autumn LaRose is going to show up and be able to participate to have some some youth voices involved in this but we're going to get started and I'm just going to let you know who who you're going to hear from today. So we've got Kate Gillis, a Métis woman from Calgary, Alberta and a master's student in the Indigenous Studies Department at the University of Saskatchewan. She's got a background in history. Kate's thesis project focuses on the distinct role Métis women played in the development of the community of St. Francis Xavier in the Red River Settlement. So crucial research, right? You can say Louis Riel almost anywhere on the planet. Everyone knows who you're talking about, but there were women involved in that that played key roles and we need to be able to do that. Uh, talk about those women recognize the roles of that. So welcome, Kate. We've got Caroline Tate that everyone knows, Dr. Tate. Carolyn holds a PhD in medical anthropology from McGill University. She's a professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Saskatchewan. Dr. Tate is a member of the Métis Nation Saskatchewan and grew up in a small Métis community in central Saskatchewan near Batoche. For the past 25 years, Dr. Tate has conducted community-based research, research in partnership with First Nations and Métis communities, organizations, national, provincial, and all levels of Indigenous governance. She is the nominated principal investigator of the CIHR funded Saskatchewan NEIHR, the Nehawewin Mamawikikayak, Caroline, my correct me on that. Research Networks, the NEIHR National Coordinating and Saskatchewan Indigenous Membership Network. With Dr. Michael Moser, a kidney transplant surgeon in Saskatoon, Dr. Tate established the 2019 Saskatchewan First Nation Métis Organ Donor and Transplantation Network, made up of knowledge keepers, persons with lived experience, researchers, physicians, and students. And, Car and Caroline's been a leader on the identity issue as it unfolds right now. And she's got many, many, many students that she mentors. And she's a sister to many of us in terms of how we deal with all these issues. <clears throat> I haven't heard if Autumn's made it back yet, but I'll give you an introduction to Autumn. Autumn is a proud queer Métis student who attends SUNTEP, Saskatoon, and is currently transitioning out of her role as the Programs and Outreach Administrator for We Matter. Autumn recently became the first elected president of the Provincial Métis Youth Council and appointed Minister of Youth for the Métis Nation Saskatchewan. In 2021, she finished her term as the president of the University of Saskatchewan Student Union, representing just under 20,000 undergraduate students and was the first Indigenous woman to hold this position in its 111-year history. Autumn is an active volunteer in her community. She sits on the board for Out Saskatoon. She is passionate about her Métis identity, community, language, and of course her pets. So we're really hoping Autumn gets let in here or connected by phone somehow that we can get Autumn's voice in here. Now the last panelist that I'm going to mention today doesn't need an introduction from anybody in this room, but we'll give we'll give we'll put some words to uh, Maria Campbell, who's got more honorary doctorates than anybody else I know. She's a dedicated volunteer, activist, advocate for Indigenous rights and the rights of women and children for more than 40 years. 
Campbell opened the doors for Métis writers who never called her Campbell in my life. Maria Campbell opened the door for Métis writers when she authored her best-selling autobiography, Half-Breed, in 1973. She has since written eight books and dozens of stage plays, including Flight, a first all-Indigenous theatre production in Canadian history. And for the last few decades, Maria has been a mentor for young people, including the University of Saskatchewan students, and she's a cultural advisor to the College of Law. After being an Indigenous scholar, writer-in-residence, working as an assistant professor in arts and science, She's made an officer of the Order of Canada in 2008 and the Saskatchewan Order of Merit in 2005. So we've got a great panel set up for you today. And this is our out loud, out loud thinking, okay? So this is our experience of coming together to think out loud. And I wanna set some context for what we are living currently in this reconciliation era that it's an uncomfortable space. It's very uncomfortable. So if you're feeling frustrated and you're feeling all the feels of what it means to bear that truth, then you're in the right room, okay? And so just, just let that go as we move into this discussion. Each of the panelists are gonna get about 15 minutes to talk about a few things. And they were given a set of questions to think about while we prepared for this. And I'm gonna tell you what those questions are. <clears throat> introduce yourself, speak briefly about what it means to be Métis. What is the impact that Indigenous identity fraud has had on individuals within the academy and why is it important to amplify Métis voices in schol and scholarship? And how can I do Indigenization policies impact Métis identity and representation? So this is a really important time for us. It's about voice, it's about inclusion, it's about recognition, it's about our personal networks, it's about do our governments stand up to these, to these demands? Do we know, can we rely on the systems we created? And what's our life look like at work? Because although we're talking about this in an academic setting today, it's not just an academic issue. There's lots of people that are working in industry, government that are that are also dealing with all of these issues. So we want to think about this overall discussion as something um, that we want to get something out of. We need to grow something. We need to create some talking points. We need to have a foundation upon which we understand how we bring Métis voice to the academy, to government, to our coffee tables, to our visiting centers, and why we need to do that. What do we want the world to know about this? You can tell from some of the chats that there are, this is happening in many nations across the country. I've been getting emails, uh, Dr. Tate's been getting emails from all over the world about this issue. And so it's, it's timely, it's important. And it's important that we're having this conversation. So to set us up, I'm going to invite Maria Campbell to talk to us about how she thinks about being Métis, where that comes from, what inspires her, what grounds her, and the comments that she'd like to make at this time. And so it's about 25 after 10, Maria, if you want to take some time right now to just get us started. Your microphone is muted, Maria. Thank you. I've made notes and I'm going to try and follow them so that I can get to the point. And um, thank you, all of you. Um, I'll just start. So when I think about being Métis, these are the things that I think about. Nitsanak, Beakoskan, Mufami, Nuakumaganak, Ntaski, the big square win, the Tapsin win, Kyogre win, which all means beginning with Nitsanak. Brothers and sisters, Beaguskan, one bone, Mufami, my family, 
all my relations. I know all my relations and I think of them often. I know who they are. I know where they come from. I know where they're buried. And as my good friend Paul Chartrand often says, I know who's going to bury me. Ntaski, I know my land. Ntikswewen, I know my language. Ntapsinwen, I know my worldview. And I know these come from the land that I was born and raised in. And on that land, I know all the plants, I know the animals, I know the birds, the fish, all of the crawling things. And I know the plants, the seasons, and all of the moods. And I also know that the land is my mother and that all of those things are my relations. Kiukewen means visiting, talking, Laughing, sharing, feasting together. Openasuen means lifting each other up. Egwen stohten mean out the bemsuen. I understand what it means to own myself. I was very privileged as a as a child that I was taught this from birth. Nobody ever pointed those things out to me. It was something that I observed and lived with all of my life. And when I say privileged, I, I am sad because my children didn't have that privilege, not in the same way that I had it. And my grandchildren had even less. And my great-grandchildren, again, even less. And I really tried to share all of those things with them, as did my father while he was here. So I feel privileged, and, and that's always an emotional thing for me. And I promised myself I wasn't going to get emotional today. But it's really hard. All of those things are really hard, because as a, as a Michif woman, I find that like many of you, and, and especially for people of my generation, I've had to spend my life constantly having to defend who we are and our right to be on this land. Our people did everything in their power for us to keep our language and our culture. My grandparents, my great-grandparents did that, and so did my, my parents to keep our language, our culture, and all of our stories. They also fought long and hard for an English education for our children and for their children, because they knew that that was the only way that we were going to be able to make change for ourselves. They also knew that we were going to have to do it for ourselves and we were going to have to fight for it every inch of the way. And so the panelists that are sharing this with me, uh, and, and Marilyn, who's our uh, facilitator, and for many of you that are out there, you're the young people that our old people fought hard for, so that you'd have that voice that they didn't have. And that my generation, who had been taught a lot of those things, we couldn't always articulate. That sounds really funny when you think that I, I write for a living and that I've taught, but it wasn't until I came to university that I actually found my voice. And so when we talk about academia, you're the people that, that can articulate that vision that our, our people had and to be able to to uh, determine and define, to define our place, who we are and our place on this whole planet.
I also want to say that for all of you, you have the support of every grandmother out there. I haven't met a grandmother who hasn't said the same things that I've said. And you also have the support of every matriarch. And believe me, there is no government or academy who will ever be signing any MOUs for us, with us, on the future of our children. What is the impact of identity fraud? What is the impact of thieves anywhere? In our homes? What is the impact of a thief in our home? What is the impact of a thief in an institution or an academy? What do you do when somebody steals from you? What do you do when they steal your children's inheritance? Their spirituality and their history. Because that's what identity fraud is all about. This is not the first time. This has been happening for a long time. It's not that anybody wants to be Métis. And if they did, they'd be crazy. Because that's, that's one of the hardest places to be. You're constantly having to navigate and watch where you're going. They want to be Métis because they want to be First Nations people. And that's the only way most of them can get in. What did we do with thieves in the old law? In the old way, when somebody, well, first of all, there's no, there's not lots of words for, for stealing. There's only one word and that's kimutuin. We don't have commit kimutuin above or below a certain price or anything else. There's only one kind of kimutuin and that's the straight theft and, and, there wasn't very many things that, that, uh, that uh, had that kind of punishment. And the punishment was, first of all, there was little things that would happen. And those things ha have happened to many of the people who have committed identity fraud. They've been told, you know, gently and kindly. They've been told not to gently, but they ignore it. And that was what they do in the old days. They take your horse away from you, maybe your saddle, you know, different kinds of things. Your livelihood. You'd have to go start someplace else because you'd unbalance the community. You, you created pain. But most important of all, you robbed, from, you robbed from the children. The children are the very center of, of who we are. They're the center of, of our culture. And if that didn't work, then you were sent away. You were banished. And I think when we think about, about the, these kinds of things and where we're going to talk about policies, we need to think about what were our old legal orders? What were our old laws? And those have to be a part of the way that we're going to, to deal with with those things when they happen. What happens to lawyers? What happens to doctors? What happens to all of those people when somebody comes along and pretends that this is who they are? I remember a professor once on campus when I first started to work there who um, said that he, was, uh, that, that he was a PhD, I guess. He was one of my uh, professors and one of my children. They got rid of him. When he was tenured, they say you can't get rid of people when they're tenured. We're talking about the academy, but they got rid of him. So what happens when somebody steals the identity of Indigenous people in the time of, of truth and reconciliation and especially Indigenization? That's all I want to say for now, but I, I really want us to think about those words because those words are, are the things that are part of our community. Thank you, Maria, for that sort of foundational conversation with us to understand 
you know, some of the language that we would attach to this peakoskan, one bone, we come from one bone. Um, I think it's really important that we talk about eventually our children are at the center. Who, are, who do we do this for ultimately? And it's always the future generations. And so, so we'll, we'll get to some, to some of those, um, those questions. Maria also raises a really important question about what privilege is. And we have it, and how do we have it, and how do you use it, and how do you abuse it? And uh, I think those are really important components for the discussion today. I'm going to go to Kate now, who's disappeared off our screen, and ask her, oh, there you are, Kate, there you are, uh, who, and ask you to weigh in now, and we'll get another perspective from a young woman that's got as a student and as, as her, an activist in her own right to just, I just want you to be comfortable to answer the questions and if Maria brought anything up for you, one of the things visiting is supposed to do is remind your blood memory of stories, so feel free to add to what you have to say. Wonderful, thanks Marilyn. I don't know how I'm supposed to follow that up. <laughs> That's not fair in a way. <laughs> I thought I was going to go last. No, anyways. Um, uh, my name is Kate Gillis and I'm a Métis master's student in the Department of Indigenous Studies at the University of Saskatchewan. I was born and raised in Calgary, Alberta, which is where I completed my undergraduate degree in history with a minor in psychology. My Métis roots stem from the Red River settlement and many of my Chartrand relations still live in present day Manitoba. To me, being Métis is about family. I don't have a background in the language, but the greatest encompassing term that I've ever come across is Wakotuan. And I, I think Brenda McDougall was in here earlier. I'm not sure if she still is, but re reading Brenda McDougall's book, One of the Family, was one of the very first times that I really related to a piece of literature in academia. And hi, Brenda. <laughs> and I think that is because it is from a Métis woman's perspective. And that is how I've been raised and what I've known. And so like I said, Métis is about family. Um, and also because of this, I have to give a quick shout out to my mom who actually made it on. She was snappy. So hi, mom. Um, but anyways, as a Métis person, every Métis person I've met gives you a list of their family members. And if you're really lucky, you'll find out that whoever you're talking to is actually your distant cousin. Um, and this is one of the beauties of being Métis. And Yes, I, as I said, this is best encompassed to me using the term Wakotuan, which translates roughly to kinship. But of course, it expands past the nuclear family that we know in this westernized setting and extends to all extended relatives and communities, as well as our ancestors and future generations that it began this work and all our future generations that will continue this work. And it is somewhere within this web of connectivity and these relations that you'll find my definition of being Métis. I'm really grateful to be here today alongside Caroline, Maria, and hopefully Autumn in discussing the impact of false claims and in, this, in regards to Métis identity. Identity fraud, the most obvious answer is that those who commit Indigenous identity fraud place themselves in a position which takes away opportunities from actual Indigenous students and scholars. This of course links to what Maria hinted at before is that those who commit identity fraud are doing so in order to access these quote unquote advantages such as scholarships and funding. But the less obvious answer here is that identity fraud is a breach of trust. The existing institutional policies that we have in place are based primarily off of self-identification. And although I expect this to change in the near future, as it has already began to with the new agreement between the University of Saskatchewan and the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan, the existing foundational principle of identity claims is based upon trust. I recently read a Twitter thread that Métis scholar Zoe Todd posted sharing her experience that she has been duped by two individuals that have recently been outed as claiming a false Indigenous identity. This really got me thinking about the level of trust we put in our peers and colleagues and how devastating something like this would be, not only to our feelings, but also to the integrity of our work. We have to consider the implications of the projects that we work on with these individuals. What if there's a paper published that is co-authored by someone claiming a false identity? What if someone's supervisor turns out to be falsely claiming an, 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 an Indigenous identity? 
How does this affect the reputation of actual Indigenous scholars and students? And of course, we're not to blame, we ourselves as Indigenous Métis scholars, we're not to blame here, but the hard reality is that these people are our peers, colleagues, and mentors. And as more individuals are outed, the harder it is to create these relationships based upon trust. As a Métis graduate student, there's lots for me to unpack here. I, unpack here. <laughs> I often explain my grad school experience as a double imposter syndrome. Not only did I face the realities many new students face of not feeling smart enough to be here, I also didn't feel Indigenous enough to be doing this work. I know that I'm Métis, I was raised Métis, my family is Métis, and Métis principles continue to guide myself in my work, and yet I consistently question my own self-identity. As a Métis grad student, it is concerning to me that individuals claiming false indigeneity are seemingly more confident in their false identity than I am with my true. It also makes me extremely uncomfortable and uneasy that individuals claiming this identity is the exact identity that my ancestors had to oppress in order to exist. And yet at the same time, I also have to be mindful that the goal of those committing identity fraud, whether it's intentional or not, is the same goal that institutions have perpetrated for centuries to convince Indigenous people such as myself that we don't belong here, which is far from the truth. It is for this exact reason that we need to amplify Métis voices and scholarship. The lived and learned experiences of Métis students and scholars steeps into their work, regardless of what discipline. Creating space for Métis voices creates space for Métis individuals to see themselves in the institution of academia and the work that stems from us. I'm blessed to be in, the depart in a department that primarily consists of Indigenous people, but I know this is not always the case for other students. Seeing things we relate to, people who look like us, talk like us, have the same beliefs and values as us, creates an environment in which we can not only be comfortable, but confident in our abilities. Moving forward, the ampli amplification of Métis voices and scholarship is what will continue to push us forward as we empower future generations to continue and expand upon this work. Indigenization in its essence is complicated to me. I do believe that there is an inherent goodwill at play but on one hand, the umbrella term Indigenous fails to recognize three distinct groups and the multitudes of culture which falls within this. It is so important that we acknowledge that Métis are a distinct people, different from both First Nations and Inuit. Within the larger discourse surrounding Métis identity, we really need to work on defining what this means. Being Métis is more than being mixed blood. And in other words, it is not enough to have a distant First Nations relative from the 17th century and your ancestry, and the national definition that has been in place for nearly 20 years now is a Métis person is someone who self-identifies as Métis, is distinct from other Aboriginal peoples, is of historic Métis Nation ancestry, and who is accepted by the Métis Nation. On a more personal level, indigenization policies often mean affirmative action, which essentially refers to saving space for Indigenous students. Again, although I believe that these efforts are made in goodwill, as a Métis student, it is something that is always in the back of my mind. Certain school programs have different criteria for Indigenous students. For example, a competing average for non-Indigenous students may be 80% for acceptance, but only 70% for Indigenous students. Other scholarships ensure a certain percentage of awards are given to Indigenous students, and these are only some of the plentitudes of examples. And although these programs exist to create space for Indigenous students, it is sometimes an internal conflict. Did I get into grad school because I'm Indigenous? Am I smart enough to be here? Would I have gotten the scholarship if I wasn't Métis? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I guess I'll reiterate once again here is that when I'm asking myself these questions, confident that I am Métis, knowing that this is who I am, it's really uneasy to me that others who don't have the identity feel more comfortable applying for these things that I myself do. And again, it's not my goal to say that these initiatives are bad or don't work. I just wanna share an additional perspective. In order for indigenization efforts to be effective in the future, there needs to be a greater, under, under, greater independent understanding of First Nations, Métis and Inuit. As we move forward, Métis representation is essential, but we need to do this in a way that engages with Métis sovereignty, primarily with communities themselves. 
And so although this discussion is primarily focusing upon the impact identity fraud has on the uh, academy, there is so much more to impact here. And I am so grateful that a hundred of you are here with us and there is so much more that wanted to be. Um, and I look forward to this ongoing discussion as it moves forward. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kate. That's great stuff. Okay, that's just, you know, you're, you're touching on so, so many things in 15 minutes, we're going to, you know, cover the history of all things Métis, and it's very difficult to do. But once we get everybody adding their spices to the pot, is this a question of affirmative action? And there's just no question that that's how doors get open in the first place. It's how women got into the workforce. It's how lots of what we now call minorities are getting into places to go. We've got, we got our LGBTQ, have we got our women, have we got an Indigenous person? And have we got a, you know, when I was on the commission for the MMIWG, I was introduced more than once as the Métis commissioner. And so it was, and, and it was on two occasions, at least because the political person had forgotten my name. And so, um, and so what, what does that mean to be a checkbox? And if you're more than a checkbox, how are you more than a checkbox? What are you bringing to the academy? Okay, I think those are really important. And as a student, I want to tell you that I, as a professor, had to tell Indigenous students to claim their identity because they had been told by family not to do that because they weren't raised poor and they weren't raised in alcoholic homes and they had no right to claim any recognition or money because they were Indigenous, because they were raised with privilege. And so Maria introduces privilege and you bring it up in a way of, I have voice here, who's protecting it, all of those things. So really grateful for that. Thank you so much. Okay, let's move on to Dr. Tate uh, at this point. And Carolyn, I really want you to, to feel free to give some context. Kate's opened the door to all of the layers of this. How, what's the impact on students? jobs, funding, how far does the deception go and what's what's a, the actual impact of this because you don't put your reputation and career on the line lightly and um, and so what what's at stake and and to just take you know take it take us through what you're going through right now. Yeah thanks and thanks uh, uh, to Maria and Kate and and uh, and the, uh, the group that invited me. Um, I've never really, it's funny, I don't talk very often about being Métis publicly, um, but I grew up uh, in McDowell and uh, uh, all along the river road were Orkney Island half-breeds, which we were part of. And then my dad was um, one of the original people that started the local in McDowell. And I remember that I was just a kid. And you know, and, and I have such good memories of growing up as a kid. I, I tell people um, two things. One, that I didn't know we were poor until I was in my 20s. I actually didn't realize that we were quite poor. That was a shocker. And, uh, uh, and then the other thing is that we weren't First Nations, and we weren't Indigenous, and we weren't Aboriginal. And I actually, that subjectivity came to me when I moved to Montreal and the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples was released. And suddenly there was this term Aboriginal, then we were all Aboriginal. And, and it was an interesting time. I was living in Montreal. I was on the board of the, the um, Native Friendship Centre there. And, and it was interesting to, to have that new subjectivity. And, and, and I'm still not sure how I feel about it because I think it's important in this context. Um, because when we grew up, I mean, I played hockey with the girls from, you know, the, who were in the residential schools, First Nations kids were there. And my mom and I recently talked about why didn't they take us away? Because there was, we were poor, but they seemed to leave the Métis people where we were alone, which was, which again was, you know, it was, was interesting. But, but this journey for me of what happened in the last few years has been really personal and, and, um, and very, um, very difficult. And, and today I still struggle with the idea that I hurt somebody um, because our values in growing up is that, you know, um, you, you don't do that, right? You know, you're kind and, and supportive. And so even though, the, the, you know, Carrie Barassa did something that 
is unimaginable in many ways. There's still a part of me that's dealing with this personal hurt uh, of, 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 of taking from others. Um, and I, I'm, I'm still struggling with that. I, uh, like Kate, you know, when she talks about the imposter syndrome, you know, I, I deal with that. I still have dreams where, um, you know, I think I haven't completed my undergraduate <laughs> degree <laughs> and I have to take a course and I'm so busy. So I have, you know, I think we all have those anxieties, but I re-listened this morning to a podcast, which I like to refer people to, and it's called Don't Call Me Resilient. And our colleagues, Veldon Corburn and, and Celeste Pedri Spade, who are, who are from the East, um, talk about identity fraud. And it, it was released on October 12th. And I was so um, taken by what they said, because it was really, all of a sudden, I, I thought, oh, other people feel the same way. And so what I was feeling and what I have felt in as a Métis person, um, you know, I'm just a regular Métis person. I'm from McDowell, right? I, I, you know, I started out, started out with terrible verbal ability and I'm still learning the English language as crazy as that sounds. Like I'm just an ordinary Métis person. And I grew up in just a really very wonderful context. And yes, there were things going around and there were things that people, you know, bad things that happened, but but family and, and community were really important and respect for elders. My dad was always like, you know, respect for the old people. And, you know, so these values. Um, and when I started to see what I start to see and when I see people who, who I would define as pretendians, and, and I think the biggest challenge we have moving forward is that Carrie Barassa was a perfect example because she was not Indigenous. There was no ancestry at all. There is no ancestry. And so when we look at, 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 at individuals like this, there, there's, there's another group, and this is the group that has been raised here, who mine, um, as, as Veldon and Celeste point out, who mine the archives for that one person somewhere that they make the linkage to. But there is no lived experience of, of being Métis. There's no training in Indigenous studies, for instance, or, or, or in our case, Indigenous health. Um, and, and these are individuals who, who their subjectivity is, is incredibly different. And I, I'm not sure what to make of those individuals. And, and I'm not even sure how to weigh in on, on them. Um, but my observation is that what happens is, is that commonly these individuals begin with Métis identity. And they begin with Métis because they feel that they can slide by and that they won't um, be questioned uh, as much as if they claim First Nations identity. And so they begin by claiming Métis identity, which they don't understand Métis identity at all. And they don't, um, they commonly um, will avoid questions of ancestry. So, so, so you, if you, you know, somebody who can't tell you where they're from and who their people are and who they belong to. But instead what they do is they create narratives of trauma so you'll often get these narratives of trauma, of family poverty, of dysfunction, but then you'll also get narratives of mystical and magical things that happen to them, right? And, and we definitely saw that with Carrie Barassa, that she goes into ceremony, you know, and, and in the ceremony, she gets a clinket name from an Anishinaabe elder. And, and, and what's remarkable to me is that people believe this crap. And it is crap. Like they believe that that actually could happen. Right now, this isn't to suggest that absolutely amazing, beautiful things happen. Um, they do happen, and, and they happen in certain contexts. And so that's not what I'm saying. But 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 when you see this happening, and what was so shocking to me was that you know I said to the dean of medicine, who who has been very supportive around this, um, you know. Um, do people really believe that this happened? Like, why didn't anyone question it? But because our institutions, um, because people in our institutions who are leaders are so afraid to, to question any of these individuals that they're given a pass to claim these mystical and magical things and, and to claim trauma. And, and I think one of the most egregious um, things that happened was that claim to trauma. Um, of, of claiming other people's narratives and stories. Um, but then we also see um, material culture used. 
Um, so you see people beginning to wear um, uh, different types of clothing. And, and oftentimes, even the people who claim claiming Métis, they, they are um, uh, wearing things that, that would look more First Nations than Métis or they're combining them in these really interesting ways. But you also see hair colors becoming darker, skin colors becoming darker over time. And there's these subtle changes that over time, when you look at photographs, you start to see these changes. And one of the unfortunate things is they often grab hold of an older person in our community. Um, and they, they tie themselves to an older person and ingratiate themselves to that person or, or a number of elders. Commonly, people who are claiming to be Métis will grab hold of a First Nations elder. And again, that's to make sure that, that you, they don't have Métis people asking who they are, but they grab hold of a First Nations elder. And, and it's really difficult to question who these individuals are. And, and because... Um, you know, because they're employed by the university and the university says they're indigenous and, and in the case of Carrie Brass, the CIHR said she was indigenous. So it's really, it, it becomes harder and harder as time goes on to actually challenge them. And, and, um, and then it's very secretive. So, so in the case of Dr. Brassa, we didn't actually know what her maiden name was. And so we didn't know who her family, we didn't know how to find out um, who she was. And, and so it took, it took us five months to, to do a deep dive into, um, you know, figuring out exactly who she was. And what was shocking to me is after producing a 77 page document that, uh, that, that we, and we knew we needed to be a hundred percent certain that even with that, that there was, enormous disbelief um, that we went hat in hand. And so what happened in that context is that once again, we became the bad people, the bad actors. Um, the girls aren't getting along. So Caroline's not getting along with Carrie. It was highly gendered. Um, Caroline is jealous. So as a Métis person, I grew up in a context where jealousy in our family was 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 something that wasn't tolerated and and I don't think I've been jealous of anyone for <laughs> for, a very, for for a very long time I just it just subjectively is not something that's part of of who I am if I'm as Kate said I, I'm more likely to to beat myself up and 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 to to feel like I haven't done enough looking at someone else's success than to be than to be jealous of them and so so it was really difficult because while we're standing up and fighting for, for our institution just to consider what we're saying as being a possibility and using all the resources behind the university, including lawyers, to look into this to find out for certain because it was that important. Um, we have other people, again, as I said, you know, somebody who's a five-minute uh, five Métis who 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 now is a is you know is at the university with me is a is now seen to be the good Métis. So there's good Métis and bad Métis. There's good First Nations and bad First Nations at our university. And so voice becomes this really problematic, and it became problematic during the time that we researched this together. Is that the voices of our younger untenured professors, for instance? was silence because, because we were afraid. And there was, the level of fear was quite surprising to me, um, including my own, about how afraid I was to stand up and how tired I am of standing up, you know, because this isn't the first time that I've stood up around issues uh, for Métis. And, and I was really afraid of, um, I was really, really afraid of what would happen. So I set up a new job for myself in another city, in another university. I have that. I <laughs> had a plan to move away from the university. I'm up north now. I live up north. I, uh, uh, I, I'm 60 years old. And, and, um, and what at the end of this, and this has been happening for a few years, is that I battle with the university 
wanting me to perform Métis. And, and, and here I am, like, I dye my hair blonde because I look less tired. I think I might look a little bit younger and I look less tired, you know? And then I'm looking at Carrie Barassa and I'm looking at a person and Belden Corburn points this out so importantly, I don't recognize her as Métis. She looks like a clown to me. She looks clownish and cartoonish and she looks like something I don't recognize that looks like any of the Métis people I know. Her dress, her, her persona, um, the way she talks about us. And so, so I'm like, what do I do about this? And this was even before I knew that, that there were, and again, rather than challenging her identity at that point, I was doing what Kate talked about. Geez, you know, I should maybe, I should be, try to be more something because I could tell that my identity was slipping away at the university because they rather would have this image. But this image also comes with, with privilege, with, with, with this white privilege that was part of this person's persona and, and her idea that she could take and, and, and that she could extract um, not only our identity, but all of our resources. And I highly suggest you listen to the podcast um, because it's one of the best that I've listened to. And, and so the diminishing um, of your identity, you know, um, at the university. And what happened is, is I, I started to feel like I wasn't enjoying my culture. I wasn't enjoying my identity. I was avoiding, I was watching a lot of Netflix. I was avoiding being Métis, I was avoiding, I was like, I just, and the only time that I felt really myself last year was, and, and of course there was COVID, I, I was out skiing. Our elders said to us, make a, make a relationship with COVID and, and do, don't use the, the metaphors of Western medicine of, of it's a battle, it's a war. And, and so I started skiing again, as I did when I was a kid and I went home and I skied at Epps Trail, which is in the Nesbitt Forest where I grew up. And that's where I, I prepared to do what we did, which was, which was this, this push forward. Um, but I want to acknowledge the Métis people who were behind this. And it wasn't us. It began with Métis students in Regina. I still don't know who the person is. I think I do, but I, I'm not going to say because I don't know for sure. Uh, I really want to acknowledge their bravery. 2009, they knew. People knew, um, and and this continued the violence, the la the, the violence um, um, towards them, the silencing of their voices, and then uh, also to to my colleague, um, another colleague in Regina, who I won't who won't won't say her name um, because I didn't ask her if I could, um, you know who who was there as a support, and so the emotional part of this is yesterday in a meeting with, with an indigenous colleague, um, you know, I said, we should go to CIHR and we should ask for money for our students. And I was chastised because there is no scientific director and who are you going to go to Caroline? As if I had dismantled the Institute for Indigenous People's Health at CIHR. And I, I was shocked and I bit her head off. And I felt really bad because as a Métis person, I, I don't like being that way or as a person generally. Um, but then I think of my aunties, <laughs> and my strong aunties. And I was like, oh my God, I'm being just like my aunties, you know, where it's like, that's a bunch of crap. You know, how dare you? How dare you in a context where you wouldn't support us? How dare you now turn around and, and somehow make us the bad people? And so even within the circles that I work in in Indigenous health, there's Indigenous people who still see us, see me as a direct threat. And I don't know why that is, but it, you know, um, but I do have hope that, um, I do have hope and I have hope in the generation that supported us. And that's the generation of Robert Henry, Chelsea Gable, um, that young generation the Jenna Gardapis, um, you know, Amanda LaValle, uh, that generation are not us. They have different expectations. You know, Kate, you have different expectations, you know, and they, they have a strength 
and a subjectivity that is so um, wonderful. And so I'll leave, I'll leave at that because that's where the hope is. And the transformative piece of the university is until our universities put us into positions that aren't Indigenous specific, until they trust. So I just want to say the Indigenous faculty of the University of Saskatchewan are trained at UC Berkeley, are trained at Harvard, are trained at at, at, at University of Toronto, are trained at UBC, are trained at McGill. We're not little puff pieces that just, you know, we're people who, who, who went out into the world to the hardest, most difficult places in Western academia and we made it. And the idea that we are less than is, is absolutely the insecurity that, 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 that um, institutions have around giving up power. Because this is all about power, make no mistake. Carrie Barassa was supported because of the money, absolutely because of the money. And this has to do with money and power and resources. And it's not only Carrie and, and, and her drive for that, it's the institution's drive for that and what that institute from CIHR meant to the university. And in my mind, it meant more to the university than the indigenous faculty. So I'll end at that. Beautiful, thank you for bringing in a number of pieces from what Kate and Maria both mentioned this morning. I really wanna highlight the effect of the gaslighting that happens at the university. I think we need to call it what it is and, and it is definitely gaslighting to shut, shut the conversation down. And you know, my work early at the university, I was being taken all over the United States and Alberta to meet with all kinds of Indians across North America and everybody's glad to have a half breed to come along on the ride and I met with senior people in the college I was in and said I'm wondering where the decision making is going here because I never hear after my great road trips what's going on or where these decisions are going and I was immediately uninvited to everything and completely shut out after that and so calling people out on it Caroline I I really, I say this to you and I've, say, I've said this publicly already, but we love you. We love that you're prepared to stand in your skin, even when uh, some of our sisters don't stand behind you. And, and we have some great sisters standing behind you and aunties and cookums, but the fact that you will live your truth is more respected than I think you can, you can know. Um, fear of speaking your truth, the gaslighting, Caroline, you've actually touched on, you know, I think people are like, what is she getting out of this? And why did this come up? And, and, and it would be the same reason for me that you've mentioned. There are students who are literally suffering under this. And we put up with a lot in our own lives. But when it comes to the younger generation, you, you will put lots on the line. One of the things people don't talk about with the residential school, um, the claims that originated, they came from two 13-year-old girls at Gordon Residential School. Two children instigated that entire phenomenon, and they are not named or recognized anywhere. And so I just really want to, I really want to highlight one more thing that you talked about, and it's the elder abuse that happens when we go and get an old person in a community to say, auntie or cookum, my mushum, my, I, I need some help. I've, I've personally read letters from people through the Indigenous Law Centre that have done exactly that, which is so abusive and a bastardization of customary adoption, which we don't have time to get into today, but I just want to put it on people's radar. This, this, this uh, idea that we can customarily adopt people and suddenly they have access to everything I, I notice they don't show up to help a lot, but there's access to everything. And, and it's sexy now because there's jobs and funding and promotion available. When they were taking the kids in the 60s, when they want to know who you are when you're driving your car, all of those kinds of things. Nobody's volunteering to be Métis in those situations, so it's very pick and choose. One more speaker today, I'm going to go to Autumn LaRose Smith and invite you to come on in and you'll have heard some things. Maria, um, you missed Maria's conversation where she really wants to hold up the youth and these young women in these spaces to say it's your turn now and she's she's done a lot of work 
and she's got a different role now and to hear and understand from your perspective. So I'll leave it to you, Autumn. Awesome, thank you so much. And, and thankfully, uh, Crystal was able to have me uh, listen in on, on her phone while I patiently waited to get in because the, the turnout for this event um, was is amazing. So I almost wasn't able to get in there so many people. Um, I guess just for the uh, introduction and speaking about what it means to be Métis to myself, I, I am immediately flooded with memories of um, being surrounded by my, uh, my Métis community in Saskatoon. My mom uh, worked for Comfy, which is a Métis local, for 20, almost 20 of my 25 years of living, um, and so I uh, was raised by going to the elders Christmas suppers and and being an elf uh, at every Christmas and holiday and um, remember running through the through the tent city um, at the camp for back to Batash and watching my cook of Nora be a judge for the jigging contest. But I never really had a deeper understanding of uh, this identity until I came to post-secondary um, and being a SUNTEP student, which is a, a Métis-based education program in Saskatchewan. And as a child, I realized I existed in a place where I was unaware of how my identity was being highly analyzed um, by everyone around me. Um, and so I had a surface level education um, from the education system. I think in grade four in, in Saskatchewan curriculum, curriculum is when you first start to learn about Métis, or that's that was the case when I was in elementary school. Um, so I shouldn't have to be grateful to an institution um, who's worked so hard to uh, make sure that I don't exist, um, but I am grateful because I have uh, this deeper understanding and this connection, and that isn't through necessarily um, the University of Saskatchewan, that's through Gabriel Dumont Institute, which um, they had to make, make their way through po protests and riots um, in the late 1900s, 1970s, um, to, to ensure that uh, Métis people could have a place to exist. And I think about um, how being Métis has a deep, um, you have an intrinsic uh, historical, cultural, emotional connection to colonization. Because um, to me, it means recognizing that Métis people don't exist without the existence of colonization. Um, and when I worked on my genealogy, I can, I can tell you the name of the first man from France in 1600 who stepped foot on these lands, but his wife, her name is Marie Sauvage. And a couple other places down my genealogy, I have the names of Marie Cri, um, and I wish I knew these women's names, but I never will. And so I have to recognize um, the, the, that their identities were completely erased from history and do my best to honor them. And, and I, that's, the, that's the complex history and that Métis people walk with uh, in, in Canada and, and in the States. I have half of my family that lives in, uh, when I go through my genealogy, I, um, I didn't realize that a huge portion of my family lives in Montana. Um, and just recently through a public Facebook post, I, I learned I have connections to, to people in Washington state. Um, although I don't necessarily um, think people in the uh, United States um, use the word Métis. And so that's where we start to see this flexibility in, um, in this specific identity. And when I think about the impact of uh, identity fraud on individuals at the academy. I think of the fact for the past that this has been going on for for a long time, um, and it's you know comes in waves, and the media picks it up, and it's uh, this really big story, and then it drops it again. And for the past two months, we've been fully consumed by this story of fraudulent identity, when we could have been highlighting amazing work that Indigenous and Métis scholars have been doing, and it's taking away our time and our energy just to to be able to speak our truth about who we are. I think it not only does it continue to perpetuate this rhetoric of make-believe, that it, it waters down, I think, our own identity that people can just pretend to be Métis like they can pretend to be a fairy or a princess. These people demote us to being make-believes and steal our stories and, and use it to advance them, um, advance themselves when our ancestors didn't have that luxury. And, and for myself, my answers didn't have that luxury. And I know that's, uh, that's a story that we all share. And, and I think that's why it's important to amplify Métis voices and scholarships. And, and so I, I work for We Matter and part of We Matter's mission is um, was how it started was recognizing that um, in media and 
the stories that were being shared about Indigenous peoples in Canada were, were more often negative than anything. Um, and so wanting to um, challenge that narrative and, and, um, and share how amazing and beautiful and talented and brilliant and um, that Indigenous people in Canada are and that Métis people in Canada are, but here we are again, um, you know, and I'm grateful for this opportunity and I'm grateful for everyone here listening, but using our time and our energy to focus on an issue where, where someone who is non-Indigenous, non-Métis has, has hurt us again and, and bringing us into an environment where we have to go through the process of healing through it, um, where we could be focusing on all the amazing work that we're doing. Um, and it's taking us away from that. Um, and I think about how indigenization policies can impact Métis identity and representation. And, and I know that it's a privilege to me to have my genealogy. I wouldn't have had um, the work that I have if I wasn't enrolled in a post-secondary institution, if I wasn't enrolled in SUNTEP, um, where in SUNTEP you go in your second year, you do a, a large genealogy project. And so I had that funding, I had that support um, that allowed me to go and be able to map um, and write down the names and, and, and learn stories of um, my great cousin a hundred years back who um, was four years old and, and fell off a Red River cart and died. Um, and learning those stories and those histories, it's beautiful, but that's not something that everyone can do. And, that's, and, and that hopefully that is something that we're able to, to start, um, start doing a little bit more and find opportunities where we can um, erase those barriers for people. So if they are interested in learning their, their historic genealogy, they have the opportunity. And there's lots of books and resources out there, but it, you know, being in a program where that's literally what you have to do, it definitely helped. And so when I think about um, the Métis Nation Saskatchewan recently signing this MOU for with the university, I think about um, how <laughs> that is, that could create a lot more barriers for people um, when they're just simply trying to speak their truth. Um, do they, how, how do they need to enroll in that process? Uh, or how do they need to use that process to simply enroll in the university? How would they, how do they access scholarships? I think it's needed because I hear stories all the time of uh, a non-Métis person getting a Métis-based scholarship and then, you know, they went through their entire education career and then it's only found out afterwards. And so absolutely we need to figure out a ways where we can um, ensure that this is really going to Métis people. But then you, you hear stories as well of um, people waiting 20 months or more that they haven't received their their little flash of card that gets them into the club um, and then they're no longer Métis right it, without that that's what the university is you know it's so it's saying the university at one point was saying we'll let you self-identify and we'll trust um, we'll trust that you're telling the truth and now because of fraudulent identity they're pushed to a place where they're saying we can't trust you um, and we're continuing that you you don't know who you are and we need you to show us this little card that the federal government and the provincial government is saying so that you can prove your identity. When for me, I just had to ask someone where they're from and then they tell me and I'd be like, oh, cool. Um, just recently, I had someone follow me on Instagram and we had the same last name and they lived in BC and we had no, in my mind, we had no connection, like no mutual friends, nothing. And I just went out on a limb and I asked like where you're from, we have the same last name, what if we're cousins? Um, and we were, <laughs> we were from the direct, like the same family line. Um, and they started telling me stories and I was telling them stories and we started sharing back and forth. And that's who the Métis people are. We know who we are. But now because of people stealing our identity, um, you making this beautiful make-believe where I think to the point they actually believe it too, um, they they take away um, they take away our stories and and they they turn it into this imaginary game where um, now nobody else can believe it and I think that um, I really like what Carolyn said and I think that's been shared shared today is is people don't view Métis people as an Indigenous identity in Canada. They see it as like the gateway into um, Indigeneity. And so that devalues our own Indigenous identity and our own history and our own culture, because people are coming in saying like, well, I'll just slip in there and pretend to be Métis just long enough and then I can be uh, Tinglet or whatever uh, Carrie Barasa was trying to say. But it's, but you hear so many other people doing that. Carrie Barasa was just the, the hot name of uh, the past month, but there's going to be more names and there have been names in the past. And so I, I think 
you know, and, and part of me, I think that, you know, not wanting to bring an individual into this, but um, I was, the other night I was researching um, the work that Carrie Barasa has done to, to see how um, she used her Métis identity to impact her research. And I, I didn't realize that all of her research was based around this idea of a Métis identity, which I, you, and which was quite shocking because when you're Métis, everything that you do is Métis, um, you know, no matter what, but because that's who you are and that's what your identity is. You don't have to, if you're an artist, you don't have to do Métis beadwork, Métis flower work to be a Métis artist. You're a Métis artist because you do art. Um, and so you see these people who are, you know, using this, this fake identity and then basing their entire lives and their entire careers around this identity, using bits and pieces of everybody's stories to make this Frankenstein version of what they think is it should be the narrative. Um, but we have amazing, brilliant, and talented people who are able to share those stories as well. And so, you know, in my in my life, in my idea of, of a perfect world, if Carrie Barassa wanted to be Metis, then I would invite Carrie Barassa in to uh, uh, cultural experiences and opportunities and, and bring her in and bring her to uh, different events. And she could have been a large part of that. She didn't have to go so far ahead as to be say, okay, now I'm also going to be the voice and I'm going to be the head and I'm going to run the research. And she had no reason to do that, but we would have ac accepted her with love and compassion and teaching and, and sharing those experiences. So that's why it's so frustrating. People don't have to be taking away our taking up space and taking away our voice to feel a part of something if they want to share that connection to it we i will you know what i mean like i'll i'll bring you to batash we can count together but don't take away my voice don't take away the voice of my peers and stop taking media time when we could be highlighting all of the amazing scholar metis scholars that we have in canada so that's kind of my my end rant noticing the time so thank you so much and thank you for letting me in um for whoever had to get kicked out for me to join the party so thank you so much lots of hand clapping everybody's loving this a beautiful beautiful way to pull everything together that people have talked about you really have touched again on these issues that we're scratching the surface on courts determining our identities and are you a Pauli Métis or a Bill C-31 Indian or do, does Daniels now make us Indians or are we not Indians do we where do we go to figure out that identity um I think you know who, where where does that information come from one of the conversations that we had in um in the women that were together was uh who's your grandma like if you just tell me who's your grandma, we can go a long, long way with that. And Autumn mentioning landscape, if I know who you are and where you're coming from, we'll absolutely be able to get somewhere about what this is. I just want to get a nod or a something from uh, Crystal that we can go a few more minutes because we started late. I don't know if we're going to get shut down on Zoom in six minutes or not. Um, I don't see... Allison, anywhere. Crystal, can you let me know about that? Uh, I think we can. So we're going to keep going until they shut us down. That's a tradition in half-breed country. And uh, so here we go. Um, I, I'd like to, there's some questions coming up about um, in the chat. Um, uh, I just want to recognize do the Métis councils who accept individuals and do card them without their genealogy not create the appearance of credibility by association and make them appear legitimate? This, this is raising an issue that's very live and something that Autumn touched on. You know, we needed access to institutions, to jobs and opportunities, and the way we got it was from self declaration and it's what universities have been using for a long time so it's so not to completely throw institutions under the bus about about what has to go on here and that we now have obligations and responsibilities as the people from these communities to to protect and look after those families and those names and those people that you know when you when you work with elders in a traditional way they they don't talk to you about your rights they talk to you about your responsibilities. And, and so that's, that's where those conversations go. Um, our government ID, the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan was broken for so long, you couldn't have 
pay, you, you could have paid for a card, but that was the only way you were going to get one. And so we have our own internal housekeeping things that we need to be really honest about, about looking after. But when in this example that we're looking at specifically here, the, the group of people that did what Caroline referred to as the deep dive really used every institutional process and used as much of an evidence-based approach as you could possibly muster and it was still falling on deaf ears where do you go from there it the the saddest day for me on this issue was the fact that cbc became the hero because nobody else was listening we haven't talked about allyship and we have so many people in communities that are trying to support us that are asking, how do we do this, that are feeling quite burnt themselves because they're starting to, they believed people and they want to believe in the stereotype that is the, you know, should I put some feather earrings on today or wear a bead or should I put my sash on every day? And like, what what's the new standard and how do you keep up and all of those things just to just to talk about identity. And the fact that we that there's been an active legislative political goal for decades to eradicate Indigenous people. And I use the word Indigenous because it's an internationally accepted word now. Aboriginal was the one. My husband, who's a, who's a Cree from Sweetgrass, says, what's the word now? Which is the right word to use? Are we still natives? You know, so where do we where do we come with these identities, and what 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 label do we give? Um, and so, I don't see um, any other great responsibility. I joined late. Um, it wasn't the government who initiated the court case. It was a uh, Harry Daniels. Absolutely, the Métis communities are using what they can to go into these spaces and claim some ownership, but. Um, there's, you've had an opportunity to hear each other speak, and I'm wondering if I can, Maria, can I come back to you and ask if you want to add anything or make any more comments after listening to the panel and hearing some of the questions? Your microphone. Okay, there's just one thing that I wanted to add, and that's the whole thing of, uh, of custom adoption. I wanted to, uh, to say that uh, I've been married twice. My uh, first husband was white. I divorced him. My second husband was First Nations and he passed away. My children are Métis, but neither of my husbands were Métis. When you adopt somebody, they become a part of your family. And, and that's a great honor. And you, 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 res you respect them, you, you, you honor them, you, you take care of them, just like they do with you. And in fact, it's, you're treated even more, uh, more precious than, than if you were not adopted, because you were chosen. But you don't become a part of that nation. You don't become anything except a member of that family. And every family has their spokesman. They have their person that speaks for them. Every community has their leader. And every family, large family, extended family, have a, have a leader. Usually it's a, it's a grandmother or the great-grandmother, but there's somebody that, that speaks for that family. But you don't ever assume that responsibility to speak for that family or for, for the nation. So I just wanted to clarify that because everybody, you know, a lot, I shouldn't say everybody, but a lot of people say, yes, but she was adopted. Okay, she was adopted, but there was a spokesperson and a leader in that family. And there was, there are spokespeople and leaders in other Métis families, as well as the nation itself. Thank you, Maria. That really supplements autumn raising sort of what what did she what did what did she consume and so we could go into long conversations about that that appetite to consume absolutely everything until you're 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 eating your own flesh because you're so committed to not being enough and having enough and everybody on the call that knows the history of our cultural teachings knows what i'm talking about there um kate do you have anything you want to add 
Um, I do, but Caroline keeps unmuting. Do you want to go first, Caroline? No? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, um, I think Autumn raised a really good point about who, who is speaking on behalf of us. And of course, Maria just touched on that as well. And um, I think this reiterates the point that we were all making earlier in regards to uh, the importance of having the right people in the right positions, I, I would say. And um, I was just thinking in my um, undergraduate degree, actually, I have, um, I have a history degree and um, we didn't have an Indigenous studies program at my university. And so I took an intro to Indigenous peoples in Canada and um, it was all based upon First Nations, which is fine, totally fine. But then we got to the midterm and the question was whether or not Louis Riel was guilty or something along those lines. And this was in my third year of university. So this was only three years ago. And I remember just absolutely losing my mind. And I'm writing this essay like so frantically in the midterm. And I called my mom after and I was like, how can this even be allowed? And and then um, I'm not sure if she she raised the point or if whatever, but um, it, it was a white professor teaching Indigenous studies. In, and so we have to, of course, wh what I guess what I'm getting at here is, of course, that there, that there should have been an Indigenous person teaching that course, or at least someone that had a background in Indigenous studies. But at the same time, what does that do, not only to me as a Métis student in that class, but what does that do to all the other students that know that I'm Métis? And what perspective does that give them on me and my family and my reputation? And so again, we it's just about putting these right voices in the right place, right? And so that was one of the main reasons that I did come to the University of Saskatchewan, specifically in the Indigenous Studies Department, because look at all these people, right? We have Métis, we have First Nations from all over the place with, like Marilyn said, these uh, phenomenal qualifications. And um, so um, I can see Jim sticking his nose in. You're included in that, Jim. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that would be my last point there is just a matter of voice and you're allowed to respect the culture, but let the people who are from that culture speak their culture. Yeah, we can talk about credentials and all kinds of things, but there's an actual knowing, isn't there? There's an actual ethic that goes with this that you know, you know when you've overstepped. And um, so thank you for, for adding that in. Um, Carolyn, just before you come in here, I want to know that some, there's been this question, I think, what can be done to ensure race shifters in leadership positions, including non-academic, are ousted? And so um, I think you touched on that a bit, but I like this, this was a monumental undertaking. This wasn't something done lightly. And so it's not just a matter of sending out a list to the community and saying, I think these are the five fakes that are on faculty or in my office here. And so I'd like you to be able to touch on that if you might. Was that directed towards me? <laughs> For sure, but you start with what you want to talk about. Uh, well, I, I actually, I want to go back to, to what Autumn spoke about, because this is really important. And this was one of the, um, it took a very long time. And I remember standing out in my, my yard saying, she's a white woman, she's a white woman, she's a white woman. It took me a very long time to think of Carrie Barassa as not being a Métis person, even though I knew in my head, I had all the evidence in front of me. Um, I had interacted with her only really in that context, right? It, with, that, um, with that relationship. And so some of the challenge, like that challenge of now that this is all on us, that, that how, does, how does the phenomena of non-Indigenous people pretending to be Indigenous people become our problem? This is actually a problem of non-Indigenous people need to figure out how to deal with their own people and that this is academic misconduct in, a, in an academic situation when you look at everything around, for instance, research um, or if you look at, you know, um, professionalism and why we have tenure. So this whole issue should be really about tenure 
and, and what it means to have tenure in our society because as faculty and in the position of professors, we're one of the only, if not the only group of people that have this luxury of having tenure and being protected the way that we are. And this is sacred. So, so this is really sacred. Research money also, I tell my, my staff and, and, and people who work with me, research money is sacred because there's somebody there who's getting up in the middle of the night and going and baking bread or working at McDonald's or, you know, this is on the backs of people's hard work that we receive this money as a gift to do our work and to have the luxury to think, the luxury to work with our people and the luxury to solve complex problems, right? So, so in the context that we're working, um, Autumn is absolutely right that this is going to breed a type of, of, of um, mistrust that amongst all of us. So, so, so they look at all of us now, we're looked at all being suspect. Right, so we're being suspect that we're not who we say we are, and and nobody's looking at non-indigenous people and, and and saying what's wrong with you people? Like what's wrong with like why? Because the, because at the end of the day, and Maria said, you know, why would anyone want to be Métis? You know why? Because of the resources. This is about power and money and resources. If there were no resources attached to Métis identity in the context of academia, meaning that, you know, um, you can't get a job, I don't think, right now at the University of Saskatchewan as a faculty member, unless you're an Indigenous hire, right? And so we've got that. We didn't create that context. That's created by the institutions. And the institutions, though, are are not um, are not dealing with the complexity of what they have created and, and the issues. So so you're right that it's going to come back on us, and we're the ones who are going to have to show our card, you know. And I've shown my card in every meeting I've been in in the last I don't know how long. And I've said if a Métis person shows you this, you don't get to ask any more questions. That's it. It's done. And that's one of the benefits of the card is that you don't get to ask me anything else. Um, but our human rights are being, you know, there, there's human rights violations and, um, and this is falling on our shoulders. So Autumn's absolutely right. It's falling on our shoulders. We're here having these conversations. And yet, you know, um, they say they're going to have a national conversation. But many of the people who are involved in creating that national conversation knew. They knew what we were up against and they didn't support us. You know, and, and so I'm really concerned that that national conversation, a lot like indigenization and the reconciliation, um, is going to fall not, um, so, so the, the parts of it that are us, we don't get to control. The parts of us that aren't us, we have to solve. And that's the way I feel. Like we're trying to solve the identity issue and the fraud when this is non-Indigenous people who should, there, and there has to be consequences. Carrie Barassa, and I'm talking about her as a, not as a person right now, I'm talking about her as the, as, as the, um, you know, kind of the organizing metaphor of all of what we're seeing is that she needs to be fired. People, there has to be disincentive to do this and, and disincentive that is so serious. And, 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 and we see that she has paid this enormous price this is really a good thing because it is a disincentive then for others to think twice about what they're doing. And we have seen people pull away who, you know, and, and so, um, so whether or not she'll be fired or not, I don't know, but there's a real chance that she will be part of our institution still. And, and that this, that she will continue to work side by side with us. And this is, again, is this going to be a safe space? And so, you know, um, the universities and institutions and the federal government, the Canadian governments um, need to be ready for lawsuits. This is not going to be easily solved. It's not going to be quickly solved. Um, you know, if you have a card, somebody raised about card, if you have a card, say, from the Métis Federation of Canada, does that mean that that's, that's a card that, that is legitimate? That's an identity that's legitimate. I don't have the answer for that. But 
we will, this will be something that will be making its way through the courts and we will have lawsuits and we will have very uncomfortable times ahead of us. And, and again, um, you know, uh, there will be people amongst us who are going to feel that people like myself and others are on a journey to, to take people down. So, so I'm not, I'm actually in Northern Saskatchewan right now. I can't, I just gonna do my research. I'm actually going to be more silent as time goes on on this issue because um, I don't want my colleagues to feel that I'm like this watchdog or this, you know, and yet, you know, a young person put up in the chat that they're dealing with this now um, with another student, right? I mean, how do we possibly, um, and it will fall as Autumn said, like we, we should be, um, our, our country takes up so much of our collective energy and our collective intelligence by dealing with things that really we shouldn't have to be dealing with, that we don't create, you know, and I think of Cindy Blackstock and the years she spent at the Human Rights Tribunal is an example of, of how our energy is sucked out. And while we're busy dealing with this today, don't ever kid yourself, our institutions are, are busy working and having meetings and making decisions that we should be there, <laughs> but, but we're distracted by these other things. And it's a very effective way, whether it's intentional or not, but it's, it, it is absolutely true. We've got, we've got so much talent here. And, and yet I know there's other meetings happening where, where our university and other institutions are making decisions about us that we're not part of. And that's the sad part is the ways in which our energy is sucked out into issues that should be easily, like as, as I think everybody said, I know who Métis people are. I can figure it out pretty easy. It's not rocket science, but yet they're making it. And that's where the podcast, they talk about how the university will say, well, it's really complicated. And that's what they told us after the, after the complaint was dismissed, they said, oh, but it's really complicated. It's really, you know, it's not straightforward. We have to take, you know, and, and is it, they had her genealogy. It was a hundred percent. They, it would take them, it took us, it would take them half an hour to confirm everything in her genealogy. What more did they need? And yet they said they needed more and more and more time. And yeah. So anyway, I rant again. <laughs> but it's not an uncommon issue, right? It, it's an, in, we're always going to be the Indian problem. It's always going to be framed in that context of this. You want to know what's wrong with police brutality against Indigenous women? You study the Indigenous women and find out why they're experiencing that problem. You don't study the police, you study the women. You want to talk about what's going on at the University of Saskatchewan? We're going to put the, the women who brought this to the forefront under a microscope because what in the hell is wrong with them? And we never are looking, we are not now classifying Carrie as a, a non-Indigenous women woman, and we sure as hell aren't painting all the other non-Indigenous faculty in, in the university with that brush. And had it been on the other foot, we'd all be painted with that brush. So again, this is what institutional racism looks like and feels like. And having to point it out is so frustrating when, when you're living it, right? Um, Autumn, I'm not sure if you're paying attention to some of the chat, but we're running out of time. We're going to wrap up after you speak. And um, there's questions that are showing up in the chat, um, ironic that we have the right to declare ourselves Indians for federal funding, but deny the right of Eastern Métis to declare themselves. Um, there was one more. There's some outrage that Carrie is still, um, she's been let go with pay right now. She said, while well, the investigation is going on, there's lots of misunderstandings about that. And uh, with Bill C-31, S-3 and C-3 giving former non-treaty and former identified Métis gaining status, Shouldn't our population be dwindling when more people are claiming they're Indians now rather than their, than their Métis? So those are some of the things that are coming up. I want to just let you uh, comment on, on what you've had your hand up for a while now. Sure. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to, thankfully Carolyn uh, said it um, in the final thoughts, but the university originally, their original statement um, was that they saw that there was no harm. They didn't hire this individual on the basis of their identity. And so therefore it should not affect um, this individual's personal 
um, status within the institution. And I think that really reflects to what some people are saying in, in the chat about how do we deal with um, people who are race shifting or um, pretendians in, in, in other workplaces or in other, in other places in Canada or in places in the, of the world. And I also just wanna bring back the comment of, you know, when I was in elementary school, you learned about Métis, um, like the one point of the grade four curriculum of the Saskatchewan curriculum. Um, and I can't even imagine what the curriculum looked like when um, university administration uh, went, were in elementary school and what they were learning. And so I think a lot of the conversation about what this has created is um, there, or what this has shown is the, the general lack of understanding of who Métis people actually are. Um, and the, the, also the ability to somehow make it this far in life without ever doing um, your own personal research uh, or learning or education about who the Métis people are, and then still put yourselves into these um, high paying governing positions where, where you are um, supposed to be there working for, um, for example, the president of the University of Saskatchewan, um, is it not, um, and other administration, is it not their fiduciary duty to um, educate themselves about people who are attending their university, the Métis, uh, Métis being uh, an example of that. And so I think it is a large portion of their um, ignorance and, and misunderstanding and lack of education that that continue to perpetuate this violence in their in their first statement and until they had um, outside pressure from um, the uh, I don't remember the, the acronym for the federal research but until they uh, pulled in then you the university went whoa 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 wait just kidding we're actually going to do the same thing um, and that's something that you see all the time with universities because they um, they're they're willing to walk in complacency until they have um, somebody else do it first or um, or if there's enough social pressure and then they'll eventually change um, they'll give you an inch um, but it, they will never change the the Students' Union has been advocating for the past three years for a formal apology from the University of Saskatchewan um, for the um, the federal law, for the for universities upholding federal law in where um, Indigenous people had to uh, lost their lost their status if they went to the university. Um, and we were met with the university saying, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! That wasn't our that wasn't our rule." Mm -hmm. um, but but they were up holding it right. And so how can the university put up these posters um, constantly on every hallway about bystander training um, and that they're off offering these free bystander training, but they don't walk the talk, right? They, they, they are the ones, maybe they're, they're lying behind this blanket of that's the federal government's rule. We just had to follow it. Well, you are um, a million billion dollar institution, right? With hundreds of people. Why is it that we are constantly here fighting on the ground when you have the money to, to actually do this work and advocacy? It's because they don't want to. And I think about, you know, I've done different speaking engagements regarding um, anti-racism and, and people are always like, well, how do we get this to change? And then I, for the most part, you don't have overtly racist people going to those kind of talks. And so I'd ask if, if you're interested for everyone in the chat or everyone who's paying attention to show a reaction if you are Indigenous or, ha um, or have a deep personal connection to an Indigenous person in your life. And for the most part, I would say that it's probably all 98 of you um, and maybe like a sprinkle of some few allies. And so again, it's um, that what I'm saying of using our own energy and saying that they non-Indigenous people need to be doing these things, but non-Indigenous people aren't going to these kinds of talks. Non-Indigenous people right, and people who continue to perpetuate this colonial violence, um, this uh, racism, aren't going out of their way to unlearn this. Um, we're, we're doing the work to unlearn this ourselves, which is, which is the frustrating part, um, because it's almost like talking to a mirror in a way. Um, when you have conversations like these, where for the most part, I think everyone here is, they came to this talk because they're all on the same page and they're all really excited to learn more because they all kind of have the same ideas. You don't have um, people from the University of Saskatchewan um, coming in who are probably disagreeing. And the other part I really wanna say is that the University of Saskatchewan Faculty Association um, is technically the, the representing body, right? Of, of this faculty member of the University of Saskatchewan who has claimed, who has, um, we know is fraudulent identity, Carrie Barassa, and they've been completely silent on this issue. And so I just really wanna, someone in the comments said, um, if, where did they say it? Um, 
something along, along the lines of someone was pretending to be a doctor, you'd fire them immediately. And so that goes back to the saying of the university's original statement where they said they didn't hire Carrie Barassa based off of uh, her claims of Indigenous identity. Um, and, then you, and then you look at the research, all the research that's been done by Carrie Barassa, and it is based off of um, her claims of Indigenous identity. And so when you have someone lying, and, and not even lying on a surface level, but so deeply um, and so intensely and doing everything they can to convince you of this lie, then you have to really wonder what else were they lying about? And how can you, how, um, how can you look at their research again, knowing that they were willing to go to such lengths um, and such harmful lengths to, to create this narrative, I, I, I know that there's always bias in research, but it really makes you wonder um, and, and makes you um, think to discredit all the research she's done, where that research could have been absolutely amazingly done by a Métis scholar or an Indigenous scholar and, and is so important to do as well. Thank you, Autumn. I, I want you to look around and see who's joined us. You know, there's 97 people left, but we've got some non-Indigenous people on this call. We've got some, we've got lots of Indigenous academics, storytellers, community workers that, and that more that wanted in, that this is a really important conversation. Um, I want to, um, I want to talk uh, to the youth that are on here and say, your future is so bright. You know, I, I've listened now to three or four panels of people that have had, in particular, young women. I'm not being sexist about this in any way, but that I just feel very secure about issues being raised in the right context with the right language, with the right heart, and all of those things. We've got, you know, Raven is on here, Chelsea is on here, Brenda was on here. We've got, we've got the people who are thinking and brave enough to put these messages out in our communities are right here. And so I, I honor that. Thank you to all of the panelists who did who spoke today and helped us walk through what's a bit of a minefield actually right now. And just to say thank you from the bottom of my heart and ask for, for participating in this. Um, there's lots of questions of where to find this. And so I'm hoping that Allison and Bobby are going to post um, something on Indigenous Studies page to let people know. Hi, Allison and Bobby here. Um, thank you on behalf of Indigenous Studies to Marilyn, Maria, Caroline, Kate, and Autumn. We really appreciate your contributions today to this conversation. And we think it's really important to be had, even though there's some difficult truths that have been shared here. Um, we appreciate all the, the people that attended and apologies on behalf of us um, for some of the technical issues that we ran into earlier. Nevertheless, we're gonna be posting this on our, our Indigenous Studies webpage. Um, and so thank you um, from Allison Stevenson and Bobby's here too. We had to figure this out, but. Thanks everybody. And yeah, the, uh, the stuff with the technical, I'll take blame on that. Uh, I thought the room was up to 300. So uh, that's, that's my problem. I tried to up it and it was $1,000 to up it at, at that time. So I just, we didn't think it was gonna blow up this thing. We thought it was gonna be a small little group of usually, he usually comes in together with all these sort of talks. So we just wanna say thank you to everybody. Um, apologies for moving forward. And, Look forward to hopefully maybe having these discussions in the future um, with everybody. So with that, uh, take care and thank you again to all the speakers uh, for their, their time today.